I wish to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this country and to the traditional owners of the country about which I'm about to speak, who have been its custodians for so long. This is a story about a campaign to conserve one of the most, world's most treasured ecosystems, the Daintree Coast, a place of extraordinary beauty and scientific value. It was a blockade in 1983 and 84 that attempted to stop the construction of a road north from here through 40 kilometres of pristine coastline. That blockade propelled this issue from a local to a national to an international battleground. It was an expose of the plight of North Queensland's rainforest. We lost that battle, but we won the war. A few years later, four years later, 9,000 square kilometres of wet tropical forests along 450 kilometres of coastline in northeastern Australia were inscribed on the World Heritage List, protecting them from logging, from roads, from clearing and from alienation into private land. The blockade was part of a broader campaign which involved assembling the science, drawing the boundaries of this area, lobbying politicians and supporting direct actions such as ours. And 30 years later, Daintree, the place where it all began, is back under threat. This is the flower, Idios Berman Australiansi, that turned our understanding of Australia's biology on its head. When I was at school and university, we were taught that the eucalypts, the acacias, the banksias were Australia's ancient species, and that this rainforest, this scrub, was opportunistic invaders from further north, from Papua New Guinea, the tropics up there. Work done by CSIRO scientists in mapping the vegetation here discovered that these flowers and the pollen look very much like fossils that were around 120 million years ago when flowering plants first appeared on the planet, when the world's vegetation was dominated by conifers and cycads and ferns and flowering plants had yet to appear. What they discovered was that this little bit of coastline had original forests back from that time, that nowhere else on the planet had that. This was a place that had stayed warm and moist for 100 to 120 million years, whereas most other vegetation, pretty much all of it on the planet, had been wiped out by sea level changes, by ice ages, by continental drift, by climate change, by volcanism. This place had stayed warm and moist and had harboured the world's most ancient forests for this length of time. David Attenborough put it in his own words, extolling the beauty and the rarity of this place, published in the London Times in 1984, at the time of the blockade. The locals, however, didn't value this place. They had fought this place to establish their economy, had pushed back the rainforest to establish an agricultural uh, economy that had um, uh, supported them until this time. The sugar mill in Mossman in 1983 looks pretty much the same as it did now, but the establishment was worried that Mossman was going to become a ghost town. It was at the end of the road. And their solution to this was to push the highway along the coast, as it did all the way from Sydney. And by having Mossman on the highway, they figured that it would rescue it from economic oblivion and put it on the map. We had a different view. We said, leave at the end of the road. There's a magnificent walking track there. People will love to see this place. Its beauty is amazing. We didn't fully understand the, the science at the time, but it was evolving. We didn't do any good with that, persuading them that tourism would be a valuable economy for this place. We said that people would love to see it. The locals couldn't understand what we were talking about. They said, why would anyone want to look at this muddy, mouldy, wet, prickly joint? 
<laughs> and the media down south thought we'd gone completely mad. They said the Greenies in the north are crazy. They want tourism. Tourism to them was the Gold Coast. It was high rises on the beach. And we said, no, no, people can come and look at this place. They can have a relatively low impact. The economy can thrive on it. But we didn't do any good. We weren't able to persuade the people at the time that that was a useful way forward. So in 1983, they said, we're going to start the construction of this road. And a few of us locals decided we'd have a blockade to stop it. And so we assembled ourselves on the site. I dressed myself in white socks and shorts, as you did it in the day, to look respectable, <laughs> not like a feral or a hippie. Um, our family had uh, built a boat, we'd sailed north, we wanted to escape society, we'd finished university, we wanted to live a low footprint, ethical lifestyle, and we found this magnificent spot on the Daintree Coast. But we quickly realised we couldn't escape and we had to take a stand. The blockade quickly got a life of its own. People came from all over Australia and the world to give us a hand, and these were amazing people. They buried themselves in the ground, standing upright, with their legs chained to a log beneath them. They climbed trees and camped up there for a week and tied the trees together so you couldn't knock one of them down without pulling the others down. We had live radio communication for interviews with radios in Sydney and Melbourne at a time when there was no telephone, no radio contact, no internet out of there. The image of John Nolan on the cross went across the globe. It was an extraordinary image to wake up in the morning as the sun rose and the bulldozers and the workers and the police assembled on the site as the light dawned to see this. The road went through. They made a god of the mess of the place. And in 1984, the mayor at the time, Tony Maijo, and the state minister for the environment, Martin Tenney, declared victory. But their victory was short-lived, and it was a downhill run from then for them from here on. And as the Father Newman blessed the road, a couple of raindrops started to fall. And the cavalcade, which was miles long of utilities and four-wheel drives, and even busloads of oldies from neighbouring towns, decided they'd better head off quickly before the rain came. But they shouldn't have done it. Halfway along, they realised that they'd done the wrong thing. They couldn't turn back, they couldn't get forward, and they were bogged. And they had to be rescued by air and sea because the road was impassable. Between 1984 and 88 was the battle, the public battle for World Heritage Listing. The government of the day said, if we get re-elected, we are going to World Heritage List these forests. Queensland government went to war, led by the Premier, Sir Joe Bielke-Peterson, who had no time for greenies. And he declared war, and he spoke of tarring and feathering people. But the World Heritage Committee, to whom the submission was made, took no notice of the state. They dealt with the, with the sovereign government. And it was welcomed because its scientific values and its extraordinary beauty were so amazing. And then, in 1989, the government changed after 32 years of conservative right-wing government in Queensland, and the new Premier, Wayne Goss, embraced World Heritage Listing. And they signed, along with Bob Hawke, the Prime Minister at the time, who had delivered on their election promise. They signed the Wet Tropics Management Authority into being, and that has been managing this place ever since. In 1991, I stood for mayor, and I got up. And I wore a tie at my first council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we transformed this place from a rural, cultural backwater, as it was then, into the greenest shire in Australia. We won national awards for environment and conservation, for planning, and the economy boomed. It thrived on World Heritage Listing. It was a fantastic thing. And that legacy continues to this day. So just this year, the Douglas Shire was recognised as one of the world's 
top 100 sustainable destinations. And tourism north of the Daintree has, has boomed. People, half a million people a year go to this place to enjoy it, to see it. They queue up at the ferry in busy times. 27 years after listing, its recognition continues to grow. And an article published in Science in 2013 declared that the wet tropics World Heritage Area of North Queensland to be the second most valuable World Heritage Site on the planet. But it's a tough place to live, Daintree. It's wet, there's no power, services aren't there. And there are people there who want urban services. They want the things that everybody else has got in, a, in an urban environment. And we have the Australian government that once used its powers to protect this area, now promoting its development. Let's get the road through the place as a short route to Cooktown. Let's put the power on. And if we do that, it's going to change the face of Daintree forever. So this is a call to action to restore the landscape that's home to the world's most ancient forests. It's time to build that walking track that we once dreamed of. It's time to buy back more land and put it in protected area, look after this place. It's time to engage the traditional owners and the local community to empower them to properly manage the special values of this place. It's time for the federal government, the Australian government, the local government to invest in its conservation, not in its development. And it's time for Australia to strengthen its national environmental laws to protect the places we love. Thank you for that.